Well, good evening. How's everybody doing? Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody. Good to have everybody here tonight. We're going to get started right away because we want to get to you. I see you brought some cloths and other things for us to pray over, so we'll be glad to do so. We also, if you didn't bring some and you would like a prayer cloth, we do have some prayer cloths, I believe, that are ready to go. So uh, we can get those for you. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 5. Not going to preach long tonight, I promise. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm, so um, we're going to cover some of these things, though. Very, yeah. yeah, it's all in your definition, right? It's, it's, it's all in your definition of what, how long long is. So there we go. So amen. Well, it's. Yeah, you can never get too much of the word. Actually, when I was back there, I was listening to worship, and at the same time, I uh, got to looking at some scriptures and going over John chapter 5 here, and just, uh, I was sitting while I go, I went to grab a bite to eat real quick, and I was sitting there, and it's just like, blah, 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 blah. there you go, and I'm like, okay, that's what I'll teach. That's, it just came, and I thought, okay, how's that going to work? And I looked at it, and go, wow, that actually flows together pretty good, um, you know, almost as if the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing, you know, so... If we just get out of the way and let him do it most of the time, is the way it works. So um, I was looking at this, and then when I got back, I was sitting back there and listening to the worship and worshiping along, and then started looking at these scriptures. And, you know, I've, um, in times past, I have talked about different translations of the Bible. Uh, and I said, you know, I've been using, um, well, I, I, I usually preach out of King James, uh, but also from the original Greek. Uh, the Weiss translation, I will use that in the, to a bit. But also, lately, I, when I read, a lot of times I was reading the ESV, and it reads good. It's a good kind of a reading Bible. It's not a study Bible. It's a good reading Bible. And then, but I've really got to where, for reading, I prefer the MEV, or the Modern English Version, which is a, it's fairly new, but it's really, I, I haven't found any places in it yet uh, that were inaccurate. And actually, I found most of the places, it's even more accurate uh, than most of them. But while ago, as I was reading the ESV, I noticed um, a major, in my, in my mind, a major discrepancy. And so probably you'll be the first to hear that I would really no longer recommend the ESV uh, just because of the discrepancy that I found in it uh, because of a scripture that they literally cut out, which we're fixing to talk about. So uh, that's what got me looking it up. I didn't know it wasn't in the ESV. They just took it out altogether. Uh, and by taking it out, you can tell what they took out is not right because it means there's a gap in the story there that you don't get if that's not there. So, pretty strange. Anyway, John chapter 5, <clears throat> we're going to start verse 1. It says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and most scholars would say that that was uh, probably the Passover, actually, because of what's going on. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, meaning having five porches. <clears throat> and in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. <clears throat> for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, this is the verse, verse 4, into verse 3, and all of verse 4 is what ESV removed. The whole thing about the troubling of the water and the angel coming down and troubling the water, the whole thing was taken out. And then it, it jumps straight from half of verse 3 right into verse 5. And if you read that, it almost really doesn't make sense. But it's hard to read it and it not make sense because you already know what was there. So your mind automatically puts it in. So, <clears throat> now, notice this though. First off, first, okay? I want to talk about troubling the water for just a minute. Notice uh, there was a feast, there was a pool, and apparently people knew about this pool because everybody was gathered up there. And this man had been there a long time, 38 years, had been lying, uh, well, it doesn't say he was there 38 years, but he had been impotent for 38 years, and he'd been lying there a long time. And so now he was waiting there for the troubling of the water because an angel would come down, trouble the water, and then whoever got in first, and this is the key, whosoever got in first, got healed of whatsoever disease they had. Now that right there just totally shoots down the idea that God is picking and choosing who gets healed. Yeah. He, he said, I'm troubling the water, and you get it, whoever gets in. He, it, it's almost as if, I don't care, whoever does it, whoever gets in first, you get it, right? And you say, well, how come 
Everybody, the guy didn't, didn't get healed no matter what. I, I don't know. I'm not God. I didn't write that. Okay? All I'm telling you is what it says. But the bottom line is, God didn't care who got in <clears throat> or what they had, which means two things. Number one, God doesn't care what disease you have. He's ready to fix it. Yeah. Number two, <clears throat> whatever disease you had, it doesn't matter because he's ready to fix it. I mean, that's the real key right there. He, and he said, whatsoever disease you have. So it doesn't matter what it is. He's going to heal it because he said the first person that gets in gets healed. Isn't it right? Now, and the thing about this, now watch, because we're going to read on. But notice the water. If you ever notice, most of Jesus' miracles had something to do with water. It's really pretty interesting if you look at it. Uh, opening blind eyes, he had to spit. That's water. Okay. Uh, I mean, just all kind of water into wine. Right? Uh, the fishes. Right? Where was he at? In the, uh, obviously, fishes in the sea. Had to do with water. Is it just amazing how much <clears throat> water played into a lot of the things that he taught about and, and spoke about and then the miracles. Now, John chapter 7. So we're going to go two chapters over. <clears throat> it says, In the last day, the great day of the feast. Notice again, a feast. Okay. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, thirst, for what? Water. Okay. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Notice not just a river. Rivers, plural. Different types of rivers, right? <clears throat> now, then he says, but this spoke he of the Spirit. So now we know that the Spirit is likened unto water and that the Spirit can have many different types of outflow, many different types of rivers of the Spirit. <clears throat> we, we're not going to say different spirits per se, but it's different types of ways that the Spirit can be manifested, okay? Which they that believe on Him should receive. So now notice, they, they that believe on Him should receive, right? For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So here he's talking and he says, if you thirst, come to me. <clears throat> and, now, and he says, come to me and drink. And it, but now notice, then he shifts because he says, come to me and drink. But then he says, he that believes on me, out, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, who, the, the one, if you're thirsty, not him, mm -hmm. but out of your belly, we would say. Mm -hmm. So here he says, if you're thirsty, come to me and I will let you drink, but now notice where the rivers are coming from, out of your belly. Do you get that? Because he's talking about the Spirit, which afterwards the people should receive whoever believed on it. So, so what's happening? Now, now get it. If rivers are flowing out, how many of you know that's troubling? Isn't that right? Because troubling means stirred up. It means moving. That's all it means, right? The moving, they're waiting for the what? The troubling, the moving of the water. So here you got rivers flowing out of the belly, as we would say, out of the center of your spirit, and that, that water is going to be troubled because it's flowing out. It, do you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to stretch to get this. I'm just saying there, if there's movement, the water's troubled. Okay? Now watch. It may not be exactly the same kind of troubled because an angel ain't jumping in the middle of you and splashing around. Right? <laughs> so, now, <clears throat> then in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, it says this. When I, this is Paul talking to Timothy, of course. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. Now notice, he said, you stir up the gift, and we know that the gift was put in him by the laying on of hands of Paul, right? Now, some people think this is an individual gift of some sort, but the only gift in the entire New Testament ever passed from one believer to another by the laying on of hands was the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's not one instance of a gift of the working of miracles being passed on and then somebody, here, I give you the gift of working of miracles. Now go do it. Uh, here, I give you the gift of faith. Go do that. No, no, you don't see that anywhere. The only gift ever mentioned that is passed on from one believer to another by the laying on of hands was the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? Amen. And usually, when the scripture describes it, anytime it does describe it, it usually says they were, it either says they were filled or it says that they spoke in other tongues. 
<coughs> which has now become the doctrine of initial evidence. Okay? Now, <coughs> in that, now watch. He says, <coughs> but, but notice, what he, notice the context too. I want to show you the, the, the mixture of this. Because he said, when I, when I remember the unfeigned faith, in other words, no fake faith. I'm talking about your grandmother had real faith. She had faith. And your mother too. And I'm convinced it's in you. Why? Because I know I put my hands on you. And I'm telling you now, stir up the gift that was put in you when I put my hands on you. Stir up the Holy Ghost. Right? What does that mean? That means that faith is involved in both receiving the Holy Ghost and then stirring up the Holy Ghost. It takes faith to stir up the Holy Ghost that's in you so that that gifting starts to work. Now, when you do that, the Holy Spirit can manifest in any form he desires, which we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is generally described as one of these nine, what are listed as nine gifts, but we know they can be manifested in several other ways, right? Now, so all I'm saying, I'm not trying to limit this, all right? I'm just saying what he was talking about. So faith has a lot to do with it because he says that's, he said it was in your grandmother, it was in your mother, and I know it's in you too. And he says, so you stir up the gift, right? And that word stir up, now, now look at this, <clears throat> because it literally means to rekindle. So apparently, Timothy, based on the, all the scripture there about 1 Timothy, because uh, he, he told me, he said, don't let anybody, don't let any man despise your youth. You know why I put you there. You know my life among you. You know how I've lived. You know the message. Preach it. Don't let anybody put you down just because you're young, right? Because apparently he had people coming in trying to bully him, right? Why? Well, we've been around longer. I'm older. I know more. And so Timothy said, uh, Paul was telling Timothy, no, don't go by that. I put you there. You know me. You were with me. You know what to do. I told you what to do. Don't let that happen. Don't let any man despise your youth. Be an example of the believer and live this life in front of them, right? Now, because you'll see that. A lot of times you'll see, especially if somebody is uh, younger or considered younger even in the faith, in that sense, there sometimes older believers will try to bully them. And they'll try to, well, you, you, you shouldn't be in this position. Now, here, let me tell you how to do it. Or here, let me do it. And they try to bully them. So you can see that a lot. Now, and that, believe it or not, that's usurping authority. Just like it talks about don't let women usurp authority. It's funny how everybody always talks about the women not usurping, but men can usurp authority also, yeah. right? Either way, it's wrong, right? Now, so then he says, <clears throat> for God, now watch this, stir up the gift that's in you, okay? I put you in remembrance. I'm reminding you that you have to stir up, rekindle, relight, fan it in the flame, Right? the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. But in contrast, rather than the spirit of fear, he's given us the spirit, because isn't that what he's telling them to stir up? The spirit, right? And he says, but God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So the spirit we have is the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of the sound mind. All three in one, it's not three different spirits. Are you, are you with me so far? Now, watch this, because he goes on. Now, the word power in that verse is a Greek word, dunamis. It's the same word found in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power, miraculous ability, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So now we see that same power connected here. He said, you uh, stir up that gift that's in you, the Holy Ghost that's in you. And why? Because that is the Holy Spirit. He is the gift of power. And it's miraculous power. And then he could even go back and say, remember the day of Pentecost? Remember how I told you what happened there? Okay, it's the same thing, same power, okay? And that spirit also is the spirit of love, agape love, right? The kind of love, actually one translation actually says, divine self-sacrificing love. In other words, a, and it also says a love that gives without the thought of receiving back. Now think about that. That is divine self-sacrificial love. And he said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of power, miraculous ability, explosive power, right? He is also the gift of divine love, self-sacrificing love. So these are characteristics that should be in the person that has this spirit. You got that? Then he says, watch this, he goes on, that's agape, divine love. And then the last word, sound mind, is a long word, and it's actually, well, it's a long Greek word, okay? pronounced in Texan, something like this, okay? <laughs> it's sophronismos, okay? And that's as close as I'm going to get, right there, okay? Uh, if I go any further, if I try to add to that, I'll just go off in tongues. It was just the way to work. So, now, and it's pr pronounced or, or uh, translated as 
uh, a sound mind. But the actual word technically means self-discipline. You get that? Self-discipline, self-control is another way to translate it. Think about that. So they said that a sound mind is a mind that has self-discipline. So a self-disciplined mind, a, a mind that moves toward self-control is a sound mind. You get that? And so we're not talking about just a thought process. We're talking about a thought process that leads to discipline in your life. So if it doesn't lead to discipline in your life, you're not, you're not a sound mind. Right? So you have to take control of your mind. Now, that's not the message tonight, but I want to move on quickly. I'm just trying to emphasize these things. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of dunamis, right? But of power, miraculous ability. He's given us the spirit of love, agape love, self-sacrificing love that doesn't expect anything in back, in return, and of a sound mind or a mind that is disciplined and self-control. You got that? Those are um, characteristics of the Holy Spirit that he told him to stir up. So what does that mean? That means he was telling him, look, operate in power, operate in love, operate in self-discipline. He said, you stir up that gift, that gift, you stir up that gift, this is what's going to happen. Why? Because that's who that gift is, right? Now, then he goes on and go with me to Romans chapter 8. Because in Romans chapter 8, we could go into a whole lot there because this whole chapter is just amazing anyway. But we'll go right, right, right to Romans 8.11. And Romans 8.11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Now, look how many times he says that. <clears throat> he said, first off, he says, If that spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Then that same, he's going to quicken your mortal body. How? By that same spirit that dwells in you. He says it twice there to emphasize this spirit is dwelling. He's not visiting. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, fall and leave. He, he comes to stay. Amen? He dwells. The word dwell, we, we could even take it further and say that he, if that same spirit abides in you. Because that's what Jesus said. And he said that he will come and, and you know him. And he is with you and shall be in you. And the word in there literally means to make oneself at home. The same thing that dwell means, same thing that abide means. It means not just, not, not even to move in to visit, but it means literally to move into and settle down in and to make oneself at home. Now think about that. And, and I remember when I was reading this and going back to the Greek, uh, Kenneth S. Wiest in his word studies, he actually asked that question. He says in, in the little chapter, or little uh, paragraph that he wrote about this verse, he said, does the Holy Spirit feel at home in you? Or does he feel like an unwanted guest? Now think about that. Now that's, that's really something we could dwell on that for a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And, and does he, is he able to settle down? Is he able to, yeah, you know, you ever go visit somebody? Even if it's relatives. You know, you can go to a friend's house and feel more at home than you can at a relative's house. Right? We're not even going to go there tonight either, but I could preach on that a little bit. Okay? But, because there are some people that just make you feel at home. Right? And other people, it feels like, well, I'm here, but I'm really, you know, I don't have, I'm, I'm not at liberty to just relax. And that's the difference. The Holy Spirit wants to be able to move into you, dwell in you, relax in you, and do his thing without worrying about what you're thinking about it. I mean, are you holding him back and saying, no, don't act that way? You don't know who's around. And so, now watch this. <clears throat> if the Spirit of him, that raised up Jesus from the dead. So now we know the, not even the limits, but at least the degree of power that has been displayed by the Holy Spirit. We know that the ultimate display so far has been raising Jesus from the dead. And basically that's the, that's the bar. If the Holy Spirit can do that, nothing is too hard. Right? Now, then he says, if, he dwell, if that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, makes himself at home in you, lives in you, stays in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, which means to make alive, right? It could even say to heal. It's not the actual word for heal, so I don't want to go too far in it. But now notice it says, he will quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by his spirit. So how's he going to do it? By his spirit that dwells in you. He's not going to do it from a spirit outside. He's going to do it from the spirit inside, right? And if you look at, well, again, I, wanna, I don't want to push something or, you know, just 
say something. But if you look at um, how Jesus was raised from the dead, see, for, the, for one thing, um, people, there's arguments over what they call the Shroud of Turin that Jesus, they say Jesus was wrapped in. And, and it's an amazing piece of cloth. And, you know, I don't technically have an opinion either way because I don't care, right? Uh, the big thing is, if it was Jesus's, he ain't in it now, right? <laughs> so either way, it really doesn't matter, okay? That's like, I never understood that. You know, Abraham Lincoln slept here. So what? <laughs> you know? Big deal. He had to sleep somewhere. It didn't, didn't even mean he wanted to sleep there. You know, but he did. So anyway, so, so think about it. So just because somebody slept there doesn't mean they wanted to, right? So anyway, uh, but with the, with the Shroud of Turin, one of the things that, one of the reasons I don't necessarily agree with it being the Shroud of Jesus is because whenever they would wrap these bodies like this, they would actually wrap them in a way that with a, a compound that would almost become like a hardened shell and that it would be almost like a mummy and harden like we would almost like a what today what we would call paper mache very similar to that so it would be a hardened shell and so it would not be the type of cloth that they would say now that's just one aspect and I, I'm not trying to you know impose any doctrinal thing on it <clears throat> but the the point being that whenever uh, if even if you look at those things and if you go by the Shroud of Turin and said yeah that's a it's a real thing the amazing thing about it would be that the, it was printed onto the shroud almost like a negative, which means there would have had to be a very intense light source from the very inside of it shining outward that would cause that negative image to be put onto that cloth. So, yeah, so you could, if you look at the, the cloth itself, which means, now think about that. If the Holy Spirit is going to raise Jesus from the dead yeah. by the Spirit that dwelt in him, just like he's going to quicken us by the Spirit dwelling in us then he's going to have to do it from the inside out, which means there would be this burst of power from the inside out. And at that point, then Jesus would have come out of the shroud or out of the uh, burial clothes, however you want to say it. And so whenever it, um, at that point, it would have been a, an, an extremely intense bright light, right? Okay. Which would have left that. Now think about that, because that is so similar to what would have happened at the very beginning of creation when God said, light be. It would have been that burst of power, and it would have been a burst of light, because that's what, Jesus, what God said, so that it would have been a burst of light, and that light would have been a power. Is that, are you with me so far? Yep. Now, yeah. so at that, all I'm saying is this. <clears throat> we forget sometimes when we come like this to a healing service, and we're waiting for the person to touch us, and we're waiting for something like that. But really, and, and we can do that, but if you're going to do it, you're really only going to be able to find that in the Gospels and in the book of Acts you really don't find it in the, 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 uh, the epistles themselves so much. You do see uh, in uh, James where they talk about, about anointing with oil, so there had to be a touch, obviously, but mainly they give credit to the prayer of faith, healing the sick there. But now notice the, the anointing with oil is representative of the Holy Spirit, so it's still we could say that it would be the Holy Spirit working from the inside out to heal the person. Now, many times we think when we touch somebody, the power goes from a person to a person, and you know, I touch them with my hand, or if you touch them with your hand, then it, the power goes through the hand, touches out of your flesh into their flesh, and heals from the outside in, when it's exactly the opposite. Because I'm not flesh ministering to flesh, I'm spirit ministering to spirit. So actually, the power goes in and then comes out, just like pouring water on a plant. You pour water on a plant, it doesn't soak in through the leaves. It goes into the ground and soaks from the root and comes out from the inside, right? Mm -hmm. The life of Jesus Christ in a believer, by the, which is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that Spirit in us is what affects the healing in the person you're ministering to. So when you lay hands on somebody, it's not like pouring water on the leaves on the outside. It's pouring water on the root, and it goes in the root and then comes out. And that's why sometimes... You don't always see it right away on the outside, but it can be affected on the inside, and then it can be two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, something like that, before you actually see or feel anything on the outside. Yeah. Now, this, you see this in Jesus' ministry. Most people think everything happened instantly, but many times uh, it says things like uh, they were healed as they went, which means it didn't happen instantly. It happened as they went, and we know that's the case because one leper goes, there were ten lepers, and one comes back and says, when he realized he was healed, he came back. 
So he had to come back, but the other nine didn't. And Jesus said, weren't there ten healed? But only one came back, but he said, your faith has made you whole. Right? So now, that it, it meant even more now, he didn't just get healed, now he was made whole. From leprosy, that means whatever uh, had been destroyed because of the disease was restored. Yeah. Right? And so you can see, it comes from the inside out. Now, this takes us back to the first three scriptures that we talked about. Okay? John 5, the troubling of the water. So what he's saying, the troubling of the water, and all I'm just tying these together and, you know, not trying to make some big long doctrine out of it. But I'm saying, an angel came down, troubled the water, and whoever got in first got healed of whatever they had. So now we know whosoever can get healed of whatsoever. Right? And that God's not choosing the who or the what. You hear that? God's not saying, okay, tonight is leukemia night. And only people with leukemia get healed. That's not what God does. Now, that might, you might hear somebody say that sometime. But if that, that's only because in their uh, experience, they are exercising faith for that. They may even think that they're hearing God say it, but I can tell you they're not. It's their own mind, but if they say it and they believe it and have faith for it, how many of you know it works? Yeah. Right? But God doesn't pick who, and he doesn't pick what. He doesn't even pick when. Now think about that. All that's up to us. We get to decide who. We get to decide if it's us. We get to decide what. And we get to decide when, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Behold, today is a day of salvation, healing, deliverance, all this. So every day is that day. And he just says, when do you believe it? When, when, when do you decide to receive it? Right? And he's not saying, well, not you tonight. You can't get it tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going we're gonna to bypass you. And go. No. He says, whosoever of whatsoever. Right? right? Now, but now notice, it was, a, it was a sign to them when the water was troubled. Right? So they knew, that's when they knew to get in. And whoever got in first got healed. And it wasn't even fair because here this guy says, I don't even have anybody to help me. And that means people stepped over him, stepped around him, got in first. And they still got healed. Those rude things. <laughs> I mean, think about that. They didn't say, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, are you trying to get in? Here, let me get you in there first. They didn't say, get out of the way, I'm getting in there. And they got healed. See, and you think, well, that isn't fair. God should have not healed them. He should have just healed the man laying there. No, the deal was whoever got in first got healed whatsoever. That's just the way it works. Amen? And then Jesus finds out this guy can't get in on his own power. So what does he do? He goes and heals the man. And then people go, well, Jesus only healed one person there. Well, it, it doesn't actually say he only healed one. It just doesn't say he healed everybody else. But the moral of the story, because remember, this is John. And John said that all the things he did couldn't be recorded because if they were, the world wouldn't hold the books. So John didn't record every detail of everything. He just recorded what God told him to record for a purpose. And that purpose was to show us that God wants to heal whosoever of whatsoever. Amen. And I would even say whensoever. Amen. Right? All right. Now, but now notice the, the, the water's trouble. And then in John 7, Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. And he says, because you're going to receive, now, and he says, if you do, if you come to me and drink, now notice, if you come to me and drink, then out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So you got to drink in the water, and then the water comes out. Amen? You drink it in, comes out of your belly, rivers of living water. And he said, this he spoke of the Spirit, which had not yet been given, because Jesus hadn't yet, been, which those that should believe on him would receive, but he, it hadn't been given yet because he wasn't glorified. So again, it's talking about this water being troubled and moving. And then he says that you're going to be, that if the Holy Spirit is going to heal you, quicken your mortal body. Now, I will admit, in most um, commentaries or, you know, scholarly type works, that, at least the ones that I've read, uh, most scholars put this verse uh, mostly with uh, the, the final resurrection, you might say, or that point in time when you are changed from mortality to immortality, and there's a quickening of your body, and that that's, there's that change. Most scholars put this verse there, Romans 8, 11, right? Which I have no problem with that. I do believe that's going to happen. I do believe that's the way it's going to happen is by the Spirit of God in you will change you instantly in the twinkling of an eye, right? And mortality put on immortality. Corruption will put on incorruption. I have no problem with that. But he also said that the Holy Spirit, now we have the Holy Spirit as the earnest or down payment of the final uh, redemption of everything. And he says now we are redeemed in the Spirit and our soul is being redeemed, and our body shall be fully redeemed at some point. Does that make sense? 
Now, so at some point, you're never going to need healing again because you, you won't even be able to get sick again, I mean, no matter what, right? But for now, we have the Holy Spirit who can heal us, quicken us if we get sick, and quicken and make alive our mortal bodies right now. And that's called healing right now, all right? So in that, that down payment is not the fullness. You're not getting immortalized, okay? Nobody's body is changing to immortality or, any, or that kind of stuff at this point, okay? But what you're getting is you're getting the down payment, the, 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 the earnest, as they would say, uh, the, the, the first payment, right, on what is coming. And if now notice, if our spirit's been redeemed and our soul's been redeemed and our body's been redeemed, then, yeah, we ought to have the first down payment of it. We ought to be able to experience at least part of it. And part of that would be what? Us receiving healing now, now we're not receiving, listen, you're not receiving, uh, how would we say, um, it, it's not divine immunity. It's not like if we pray for you and you get healed, you'll never get sick again. It, that's not what you get now. You get the down payment of getting healed right now, but then you may get sick again at some time and you may need another down payment. Does that make sense? So regardless, now notice, but how is he going to do that? If he's going to change your body, at, at some point, he, and he's going to quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you, what, why would we not get healed now by that same spirit that dwells in us? Right? And you say, well, if that spirit dwells in me that can heal me, why don't I just stay healed? That's a good question. Why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you just make a decision to turn it on, let it out, let it go into your flesh, and just live in divine health? Right? Now, that doesn't mean your body is immortalized. It just means that you live in divine health. And let me tell you, as long as that water's pouring out, it's real hard for anything to get stuck in. Amen. Right? Why? You ever try to stick something into a faucet that's on full blast? Kind of hard to do it. Right? Why? Because of the force coming out. That's why whenever I minister to people, I'll tell people, listen, if I start to minister, don't pray. Don't pray. How do you think that water comes out of you? How do you think the Holy Spirit comes out of those rivers? Usually it's by your words. So you're, what, what I'm trying to put into you, you're praying and you're pouring out and sometimes you just, it's just there it went. You know, it's just, oh, there we go. It's just that quick. So I tell people, listen, don't pray. If I'm, if I'm ministering to you, don't, don't be pouring out. Be receiving in. Amen? So just stand there and receive it. Let me pour in and let it go that way. Don't try to pour out because now it would be, uh, you know, a little, little battle there going on and we don't want to have to, re we don't want the resistance. Amen? So I tell people, just don't do it. And, you know, let's be honest. Um, I tell people all the time, don't pray. Your prayers haven't helped you so far, so just stop. <laughs> Not try to be mean, but come on. If, if your prayers for healing had worked for you, you wouldn't be in a healing line. Let's just be honest, right? And, and so you say, well, I'm trying to agree with you. Well, then agree, but you don't have to talk to agree. You know what I mean? You don't have to pour out. Because out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, and if it's pouring out, it's sometimes hard for you to receive. So, because you're in a pouring out mode, not in a receiving mode. So, just decide to receive. I'll pour out, you receive. But now, notice what I'm doing. I'm not giving you something you don't have. All, it's just like priming a pump. You prime the pump, the water's there. You just got to kind of get it to the surface. That's all I'm doing. I'm just priming the pump. You ever notice how they prime pumps? They pour a little water in first. Yeah. And then you prime the pump. So, we're going to pour a little water in first, right. called the Holy Spirit. And then, then... Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, and he will quicken your body, heal, make alive your body by the Holy Spirit who is dwelling inside of you. Yeah. Amen? Does that make sense? All right, so, all right, real quick, um, I'll just be honest with you. The uh, Lord laid that out for me today, just a little while ago, these four things, real simple, while I was sitting at a table at Taco Bueno. <laughs> Amen? So he can speak to you anywhere, okay? <laughs> So, hope that didn't despiritualize it too much for you. <laughs> yeah, I hope you still think I'm spiritual. Okay, so, so now we're going to uh, begin ministry. Uh, those of you that need, how many of you need healing? I mean, you need healing. You don't want, I'm not saying you just want me to lay hands on you. I'm saying you need healing. Let me see your hands. Okay, all right, good deal. Okay, how many do not need healing and don't necessarily need hands? Well, let's just say you don't need healing. You may want me to lay hands on you, but you don't need healing. Let me see your hands. Okay, okay. There, good. All right, now, how many of you don't need healing, but you still want me to lay hands on you? Let me see your hands. Okay. How many have a dog that wants to be healed, but doesn't <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to see how many ways I could just bring that up. So, 
Yeah. All right. All right. Well, what we're going to do first, let's get to the people that really need help first. Okay. And so the people that uh, need healing, uh, we're going to minister to you first. And then the people that don't need healing but still want me to lay hands on you will minister to you second. All right. And that way, because we don't want to be able to be in pain or have to deal with this any longer than we have to. And then we'll move from there. All right. Now, as we, um, well, my, my team will help get you organized here. And then we will go through. Now, listen carefully. I'm not going to ask you what the problem is because I'm not the one healing you. Right. I'm just the faucet. That's all it is. And I'm choosing to turn on the, the life, the spirit of God, turning it on, turning on the faucet to letting it flow. So I don't need to know. You know. Right? And, and even if you don't know, how many of you know there could be something more than what you know? There could be something else wrong you don't even know about, right? Now, see, automatically people go, oh, really? I never thought about that. I could be, I could be sicker than I am and I don't even know it. So, now, okay. Now, don't, don't go there. I'm just saying, but e even if that's the case, God can heal all of it at one time, right? Now, listen, you might have five things wrong with you, okay? That could happen. I know people that's got five things wrong with them, right? But I don't have to pray five times, one for each thing. Okay, no matter what's going on, I can, if you go to a, a garden, you can have five different kinds of plants. You can pour one faucet, one water onto it, and the water goes to all five plants. And, and guess what? No matter what kind of plant it is, the water that goes in makes them well. Ain't it right? Makes them healthy and strong. So the Holy Spirit knows. He knows what you need. So it doesn't matter. When I start to lay hands on you or how we're going to do it, I'm not sure yet. I will see. Uh, it's going to, you know, I'm just, yeah, I have general ideas of how I normally minister. But I just don't lay it down that this is what we're going to do because sometimes the Holy Spirit does different things. So I'm just not making it a law that we're going to do it a certain way. I may take you by the hand, take you by the hands, take you by one hand, may touch you on the forehead. Who knows? You know, this, it just varies. Uh, I may say something. I may not say anything, right? Because it doesn't matter. The main thing is I'm going to choose to believe whenever you're in front of me that whatever I feel to do, whether it's, you know, if I'm following the Holy Spirit, that whatever it is, it'll be what's needed, and whatever, however much is needing, needed, it will take place at that moment. Amen? Amen? Why? Because he's just that big. Amen. He's Amen. just that big, he just knows that much, and he can get it done. Right? Alright, so, that's what we're going to do. Now, where... Uh...